All right, I think we are good to get started. On a recent virtual panel I moderated, one of the panelists wondered how much the GSEs will be needed once we can sell mortgages on the blockchain. We'll cover this topic and more on today's Lunch and Learn, sponsored by Mortgage Capital Trading. I'll be joined by two distinguished guests today, Carl Jacob, CEO of LoanSnap, and Andrew Rhodes, Director of Trading at Mortgage Capital Trading. I've prepared some seed questions for today's discussion, but have asked our guests to be ready for your questions too. Please feel free to contribute a question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, let's get it started. So guys, blockchain has been a buzzword in mortgage for years. What are the actual real world applications of the blockchain for mortgage lenders? And Carl, maybe we'll start with you. Oh, put me on the spot. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I think at the end of the day, there's lots of different applications. We're seeing a whole bunch of innovation happening in and around the edge of the blockchain and mortgage. Our excitement is really on the takeout side. So the idea that there are a lot of people out there who are interested in assets that are, exist in the real world and in some ways are a hedge for the assets that exist in the, in the virtual world and their ability to access those. And so we think the, the opportunity is really in building a takeout partner or a takeout vehicle that exists on the blockchain and is funded by people putting money into their wallets and then putting it into the protocol. And that protocol then being used to, to purchase loans from originators. We'll have to dig into some of those terms in a, in a, in a, few, in a few minutes um, as, as when you walk us through how, how LoanSnap is doing this. Uh, Andrew, I'd love to get your perspective on this. How, how are you and, and MCT thinking about blockchain as it relates to the to the secondary market? So, I, I mean, one of the one of the great things about blockchain is that it really does provide kind of some truthfulness, right? In, in terms of the data that you're looking at, um, you know, the immu immutability of the of the blockchain. You know, having that that data kind of just being consistent. You know, one thing that I think we're going to see. Um, as as things kind of evolve into the future is, you know, I, I've heard of some uh, some companies starting to look at borrower data as uh, essentially an NFT. So I would essentially have my own NFT and it would have all my personal data tied to it. And then I'd be able to, to kind of go to, you know, go to different lenders and say, hey, you know, here's my NFT. And they'd be able to, to take a look at that, kind of look at the loan parameters and, um, you know, see if it, if it would be a good fit for them. So I think I think the 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 just having the trustworthiness of the data behind uh, origination is going to be you know uh, is going to be a great thing for 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 the future. Uh, I I, th I still think that you know there's a, a lot of adoption that needs to take place in order for for uh, this technology to kind of to, to come into the limelight. But um, from a secondary standpoint, I, I definitely see it as kind of uh, helping out the originators during the whole lending process. And then to, to Carl's point, you know, the, the whole takeout on the back end as well, I think it's going to be, um, I mean, it's just in a, there, there's a lot of, lot of different ways that it could go. And it, it's going to be interesting to see kind of how it all evolves. Let's, let's take it back to the basics, Carl. Uh, you know, what, what is, what is LoanSnap, the company that you're, that you founded and that you're CEO of, and, and how does it relate to, to mortgage and the blockchain? Yeah. So we're basically next generation originator. Uh, we basically built, rebuilt mortgage from the ground up, including a loan origination system that uses AI in order to close loans much more quickly and efficiently than, than was possible in the past. Uh, to give you an example of that, we closed, have closed loans in 24 hours. Um, and so you know, I'm pretty sure that's a record and then some. We still have to wait seven days uh, after that period, of, of course. And so when we're building that, part of what we started thinking about is who could operate at that speed on the takeout side. And, and obviously there, there wasn't really anybody. And so we built what we call Bacon Protocol. And Bacon Protocol is designed basically to allow anybody in the world who has a DeFi wallet, who's kind of on the blockchain and is you know part of this ecosystem to come to our website and put money into a coin. And the coin is backed by a pool of mortgages that are underwritten to Fannie standards. And from our perspective, because our system does real-time pricing and so pulls in the pricing data in real time, the Bacon Protocol is just one of the pricing secondary takeouts that's in the system that our loan officers 
can choose. And in the future, that system is going to be available to loan officers anywhere. So we're, we're opening that system up. It's a cloud-based system. So you'll be able to be in you know Pennsylvania and on the weekend originating mortgages and having the takeout happen on, on the blockchain, which will be, will be very exciting. So two quick follow-up questions. Uh, w- w- what does bacon stand for? Are you just a big fan of bacon or is that, that, that stand for something? You know, it's interesting. Uh, we had all kinds of names that were proposed. I, I didn't come up with this name until uh, my creative director came and said, do you know what bring home the bacon means? And I said, I got to say, I have no idea. He said, well, it literally, it's an old term. It literally means using your body to make money. It's a, and so, you know, that's kind of what people want to do. They want to use something to help make them money. Hopefully they don't have to use their bodies to do it other than typing in a couple of, of keywords. Uh, and that kind of took off inside the, in the company and became, you know, the, the name of the protocol. And the coin that we did, the first coin is called Be Home. So uh, the, the protocol is called Bacon. Uh, a little bit of a nod to the crypto kind of uh, non-standard stuff that you see out there. And then the Be Home kind of back back to the more normal world that we all live in, uh, where you have real homes backing the, the, the items themselves. And t- to that end, I think it's going to be interesting. Andrew mentioned you know, kind of personal information on the blockchain and everything like that. Um, you know, what we expose is just the lien, which is the same thing that would be exposed to the public through the county. We don't expose any, any personal information at all. And I think I'm able to kind of like take my portfolio in a way that, that can be um, seen by lenders and, and other people. We have to figure out the, how much of that should be public or not. I mean, you couldn't do that on the Ethereum blockchain because everything's public. Yeah. yeah it, so, go, go, ahead, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, Diego. No, no, that's a, no, that, that's a really important um, thing that we've kind of been looking at from our side as well. So um, not to, not to um, <clears throat> kind of go off on a, too much of a tangent here, but, um, you know, we've kind of been working with some uh, blockchain technology on our side as well, uh, working in the secondary space. Uh, you know, we're doing um, to be announced mortgage security uh, TBA transactions uh, with broker dealers to, to kind of offset the interest rate exposure for our, um, you know, for our lender clients uh, that need that management. Um, and one thing that our, our engineers kind of uh, found was that. You know, working with a with a blockchain or with a Ethereum, you know, you, you do kind of run into that privacy issue with, um, um, you know, providing too much information to the public. Right. So uh, they've actually gone uh, and, and kind of done some research and found that, you know, working through uh, something called the, uh, the, the Hyperledger Fabric um, framework or the Hyperledger framework allows for more of a, a private uh, private enterprise or private connection. So you could transfer some of the information, but not all of the information. So you you are you are kind of taking a taking more control over your privacy in, in the terms of what you're allowing to uh, be done on the blockchain. So just to kind of highlight what Carl was saying, I, I think you know we're we're all kind of we all uh, being in the lending industry. I think everybody understands the the importance of privacy. I know I still have to take a class on it here in uh in before the end of the month. Um, but yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a it's a definitely a huge priority. Carl, uh, there's another another basic question here. Um, what exactly is a, is a takeout? Oh, sorry for for us. That's uh, the term that, that we use. So anybody who would purchase the loans from us. So currently, we work with Fannie and Freddie and a bunch of the government entities, the GSEs, as well as banks and and even in some cases, you know, private individuals. And so when we think of takeout, we think of anybody who's willing to purchase mortgages. And so with the bacon protocol, so our takeouts are over 300 people from around the world who put their money into the protocol. Uh, and then that protocol goes and, and purchases loans to the specifications that the protocol has, which is the FANI standards. So m- maybe it'd be helpful for you. And this is actually one of my questions and, and it's an audience question now too. Could you just walk us through that process uh, You know, from the client's point of view um, you know, the, the backend process from client lead to, to closing that transaction, how, how that all works, yeah. how, how the money moves around. Yeah, you bet. So it, it's interesting. One of the design goals that we had when we started out was the consumer shouldn't know the difference. And in fact, I would argue that some consumers don't want to know um, that 
there's anything to do with cryptocurrency going on in, in, in the background. So uh, the front end process, albeit quite different when the, from other mortgage companies, because our, our system operates on a different kind of level. So effectively, the way it works for us is you come to the website, you enter the property address and the last four of your social. And with your permission, we go pull data from a bunch of different APIs. And in real time, we build a financial model for that customer and show them how much money they're currently losing, usually to debt or mortgage that's you know not, not a great one. And then we show them what could be possible. When we show them what could be possible, um, we do some pretty interesting stuff around pricing. So that process pulls pricing in real time. So the mortgage pricing that we get that powers that savings on a monthly basis is real time. And one of those pricing engines that we're talking to is the Bacon Protocol. Uh, that sets their pricing, you know, just like any other uh, purchaser for mortgages would. A uh, little bit more sophisticated because it's driven by the ecosystem on the on the blockchain and is not tied to interest rates. Um, so it's interesting; it's not tied to the Fed rate. They operate on a, on a different frequency, so to speak. Uh, then the loan gets, you know, originated through our system, usually in 15 days or less. And once it's originated in the system and, and finished. Um, the great thing about the protocols, we don't need a warehouse line because the funding is instantaneous. And so the loan closes, the money shows up in the account uh, in what we would call fiat in the crypto world, but just US dollars, basically. And it looks just like a normal mortgage. When they pay their mortgage, um, the proceeds from that go back to the servicer, which in this case is us, but it could be any servicer. And any servicer or originator can participate in this ecosystem, which is kind of exciting. Um, so if you're a servicer in the system, you collect the money and then send it to uh, effectively a system that turns that fiat around and then distributes the proceeds to the coin holders. And so the, the advantage is you not only get th something stable against the liens on the homes, which is quite valuable, but the cash flows that come back at a ratio that banks would never do. So it's basically the inverse of what you get in the savings account. Today, you can earn about 0.1, 0.2% on your savings account where the money's being lent out for mortgages at about three to 5%. We flip that. So the consumer in our system gets about three to 5% uh, and the people participating in the process get, get the rest, the originator and the servicers um, and the, and the, and the uh, others involved in the process. And how are you um, going to market on the, I guess I call it the buy side, the folks who are funding these loans? Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, organically so far, uh, we launched it in September of last year. We were really focused on getting it right. We have a lot of people in the crypto space say, oh, wow, how come you haven't promoted this and marketed it? It's like, well, let, let's make sure we can do these. We've done uh, about $32 million in home value, um, and, you know, which is not a ton, but it, it, it worked. And so now we're doing more, but really it's been organic, a couple podcasts and things like that. Um, so no big promotion at all, which we, we feel like is a great indicator that there's a lot of interest in, in demand, uh, even though we haven't been pushing hard. So um, uh, again, going to merge an audience question with, uh, with one of my questions and, uh, and I'll start with you, Andrew. Um, you know, how do you see this, this, this innovation, these innovations um, uh, interacting with, uh, you know, the primary and secondary market? Like, are, are we going to, are we going to blur the lines between primary and secondary? Um, are we going to flatten that market out? Um, what, what are the, the new competitive dynamics that people should be thinking about as we introduce blockchain as a, as a funding mechanism? No, I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a, a great question. And uh, I mean, I think it does, um, it, it does kind of bring those two closer together, right? Because, I mean, essentially you're doing a, a direct-to-consumer um, model. <clears throat> and if they're able to go, kind of go through and um, kind of lock up some funding from, from, uh, from the blockchain or from, from, this, uh, from this process, then I, I completely see those lines being blurred. You know, even, even in the current market, um, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the current market structure, we're, we're still seeing a, a blending of those, right? To where more of the more of the uh, front end or the primary market is kind of showing up and, and being kind of forced into the secondary market. So 
um, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing that, that trend continue with just the normal technology that we have. So if we're, if we're including blockchain technology on top of this, then I think we're definitely going to see, um, you know, see that, see that continue. And, um, in terms of, you know, the secondary market, I think, you know, just to kind of to, to take a step away from, uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie, we are starting to see, you know, some private label securitizations, but those are coming from, uh, you know, the larger, you know, the larger investors in the space. And uh, they're kind of picking, you know, picking what they want and picking and choosing. But, you know, to, to Carl's credit and what, what they're doing, I, I think that that allows more, you know, more uh, uh, market entrance to come in and to kind of share in the, in the accumulation of, of this different production. So I think that there's definitely, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of growth that we'll be able to see with this new product, um, you know, in, in the future. Carl, I'd love your, your take on that same question. What, what do you see in terms of market dynamics shifting with, with this, with this new, with these new innovations? Yeah, I think the interesting thing is hard to tell, right? Um, but what I would say is uh, it's a very, the entrance of something like the Bacon Protocol to, to this environment is a very different competitor um, to other purchases of mortgages. Uh, the first is it's global, um, which is pretty interesting from, from a capital perspective. The second is it mirrors what powers the existing investors in the space. So if you look at you know, the three biggest banks, governments, and insurance companies, all of those entities collect money from consumers and turn around and lend that money out generally by buying mortgages. This goes directly to the consumer and says, hey, there's a value proposition here that radically changes the economics in your favor and removes all the middle people in, in the process. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, going to be a very interesting competitive dynamic. It's, it's basically the bottom up versus the top down. And we'll see, I think, as people adapt to that, I mean, some of the, the people we're talking to are those entities. And the way they look at it is, well, look, we could go buy a bunch of Fannie loans, or we could go buy a bunch of loans from a bunch of originators, or we could buy this coin that is backed by that same product but the economics are quite a bit different than the economics they're currently, look, currently looking at because there's a lot fewer people involved in the process taking the cut. Do you think that we end up moving towards a really disaggregated set of buyers or uh, could there potentially be, you know, one or two players that, that, that end up dominating, um, uh, you know, just like there's a couple of players now dominating in, in, in secondary? That's a great question. Uh, it turns out, um, well, there's there's a lot of money on the blockchain and a lot of money moving toward it. Um, and a lot of those institutions like KKR are completely comfortable buying crypto. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like one of those great uh, battles that's going to occur, right? Is, is it going to, but it's not going to be played on a U.S. soil, right? It's going to be a worldwide thing. And, and there could be groups. I mean, look at the, the Dow that almost bought, you know, a copy of the constitution, right? I mean, that, that's t- the fact that that happened and competed against these massively wealthy individuals and institutions is just crazy. And I think, you know, these things tend to start small and grow big. I was at Facebook when it was six guys in a house in Palo Alto, and that got pretty big. And so in, in this case, we think it's small, but I, I heard a great statistic the other day, 50% of the people, the citizens of Germany own crypto. And that's a country where people I'm sorry, credit cards. Repeat that percentage again? 50. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> so I, 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 I think that's the, this is coming and it's coming fast. And it's interesting, you know, I, I'm of German descent. So it, it's interesting. Some of my friends in Germany, like they would never touch a credit card. They do almost all their transactions through debit cards or direct direct payments. And the fact that that move has happened to cryptocurrency at that level in a country like like Germany, I think portends that this is going to be a, a, a pretty powerful force in a lot of industries, in, including this one. Andrew, a great question has come in. Um, 
uh, so, you know, someone said your, your, your work screens look far more complex than, uh, and sophisticated than, than their, than their basic Excel sheets. Do you find that consumers are intimidated by blockchain applications? Yes. Uh, I think that just a, a simple answer there. Is, I'm, in, I'm intimidated. So I imagine. <laughs> no, it, it, I mean, in, in all reality, I was talking to, you know, talking to, um, you know, one of my buddies who's, you know, pretty, pretty, he, he does pretty well in the stock market. And he, you know, he has a lot of, um, not, not a lot of time, but he's, he's also, he's always kind of managing his portfolio and looking at different stocks to add and subtract. And I asked him, I was like, Hey, what's your take on blockchain? He's like, I don't mess with it. So if you have somebody that's kind of sophisticated in understanding stocks and they don't want to get into blockchain because or they don't want to get into cryptocurrency because they don't understand the ins and outs of it, it, it really does. That's why I was kind of just saying yes, pretty bluntly that I think it does scare a lot of um, a, a lot of people. Um, I, I think, you know, what I have behind me just kind of talking this through with Carl, I mean, if we're if we're not doing interest rates. Uh, through the Fed and, you know, through the government, and we're, we're kind of basing it on, you know, a global kind of uh, supply and demand, then that that's a completely different story to what I do on a daily basis um, in, in terms of hedging, right? Because if I, if I don't have a baseline to determine, you know, what I need to hedge, then I can't hedge that appropriately. And then, uh, you know, I lose my client's money, then I, I lose a job. So um, I would say, but to, to kind of go back to, to your uh, question, I would say that, yeah, I think it does scare a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of um, unknowns about it. Uh, I just did a, a quick um, look on, uh, uh, on, on the Googs and uh, it was saying about, I think it was 8.7% of uh, Americans hold crypto. So if that if that it kind of highlights the the difference between you know Germans owning about fifty percent and the U.S. owning you know less than ten percent, I, I think that there is some education that needs to happen uh, in terms of kind of getting people up to speed on um, on access to it, and then also you know what does it mean for them? Because I think there are kind of still a lot of unknowns, and um, I think the more education we get uh, out to people, I think the more comfortable people feel with it. And I think that will lend to, you know, more companies adopting, uh, you know, this, this kind of strategy moving forward. Um, and I think it, it really, it does, it is going to come in time. Uh, I was looking at something yesterday, and this was a, a report that Fannie put out. Um, uh, I think they put this out like last month, just talking about um, some cryptocurrency and mortgages. And they were saying out of the, I think out of the lenders that they uh, sent the survey out to, um, 20% of them said that they started looking at blockchain. Uh, and then uh, on the flip side of that, 68% of them have not looked at, at, at using blockchain. So there, there is a, a large disparity in terms of lenders looking at blockchain as well in, in the mortgage community. So I think we need to get more people, uh, more people involved. And I think um, you know, just having this, these couple minutes with Carl, like it, it gets me, it gets me excited about kind of the future and what, what's going to, what's going to happen with blockchain. I think, you know, we're just kind of on, on our side, we're kind of just really, um, on top of the surface of, of the whole, uh, transaction process. Cause we look at it in terms of, you know, that trustworthiness that I was talking about earlier. So when we're doing two TBNA, uh, TBA transactions, you know, we're, we're set it, selling that short and then potentially we're assigning that to an investor. And that really, that whole process in the, in the AOT process or doing, you know, trading bonds on swap, there's a lot of opaqueness that's involved in um, that, that transaction. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring, um, you know, bring more transparency to it. And we found that, you know, blockchain is a really good use case for that. But it's all about adoption. And we just haven't really found that there's a lot of adoption in the space right now. But I think that just comes with people being educated, right? The more educated people get on the process, I think more people are going to be involved in it. So we're definitely educating today. Uh, and the uh, I think we're going to stay off script. Um, the, the audience <laughs> questions are, are starting to stack up, which I, I find exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, just kind of riffing on that a little bit, Carl, how do you think we drive more adoption? How do you think we scale this up? I think it's just happening all on its own. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I think 8% in the United States, I, it's just one of those things that'll just take time. Everybody had to learn about stocks too. It just it took time. And I think, 
crypto is a lot easier to understand than stocks. Uh, you know, if you look at Coinbase and other people and Robinhood and how it's being integrated into some of the core services that are out there, Robinhood, PayPal, Visa has a whole crypto effort. Crypto effort. Uh, it, it is definitely going to be broad based from a consumer adoption of crypto itself. What they're going to use that crypto for, I think, is an interesting question. And, and that's what we're trying to answer, right? Is do you want to buy a cryptocurrency or a stable coin? So a stable coin is basically a coin that's backed dollar for dollar. The promise is if you put a dollar in, you can take a dollar out. Most of the stable coins out there today, uh, it's very difficult to tell what's backing them. If you take something like Terra, it's actually backed by an algorithm. If you take something like Tether, it's some assets that they get audited that they claim to have. And if you take USDC, it's basically audited as well, but mostly kept at a bank uh, called Silvergate. And it's about $50 billion that are backing that, that entire product. Our approach is a little bit different. You know, we're, we're doing the backing by liens on, on homes, which is basically what a bank does, and the cash flows that come from those. And so we think that that approach is going to help adoption because people tend to understand that type of crypto. And we have a lot of first-time crypto adopters that are buying Behome because they're like, okay, I, I can buy something and I know it's backed by homes and I, I can look at the liens. I can see the address of the house. I can see the lien amount on the house. I, I can even see the, the loan to value. And, and so that level of transparency gives them a lot more confidence than they have in, in some of the other stuff going on. So that's a, I think part of it is we increase adoption by being more transparent um, as, as we should be. And it's a new concept for a lot of people to be able to, uh, to, to see what's behind something like that. I think the other is um, like anything that's new, you know, stocks were completely unknown to most people. E even bonds were, were a concept that nobody really understood. So people don't realize that some of the early bonds, the returns were through the roof because people realized it was a new concept. And you're seeing a lot of that in crypto. A lot of the returns that you hear about in crypto are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. But um you know, people are willing to sign up for that. People are making money from some of that. People are losing money as well, um, but it draws interest. It gets people thinking about it. And, you know, when people are thinking about it, then they're sharing it and talking about it. And that becomes something that, that spreads pretty quickly. Uh, Carl, I think we should do a quick 20 to 30 second uh, review of, of Bacon, the protocol um, and, and kind of the process. We had a bunch of folks who, who joined in late and didn't and didn't hear the the basics at the beginning. So maybe just walk us through again. What is Bacon? Um, you know, what's 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 the protocol? Um, and uh, what you know, how do you how do you what are the coins based on? You got it. So I, I will. I'll try to keep this as uh, non crypto as possible. So Bacon is a, a protocol, which is effectively just a set of contracts and programming on the blockchain. It lives on the Ethereum blockchain. So there, there are a couple of popular blockchains, but Ethereum is the largest uh, for building these kind of financial services. I think there's uh, hundreds of millions, if not, uh, well, no, there's hundreds of billions inside of the, locked inside the Ethereum protocol. I don't know the exact number, but there's a fair amount of money. Um, and, you know, Compound and Aave and others have what they call total volume locked of, of you know, 10, 20, 30 billion. So these are, these are pretty big, financial institutions already. But a stable coin, effectively, the idea behind a stable coin is that it's backed dollar for dollar. And so if you put a dollar in, you can take a dollar out. And that's the guarantee. Of course, that was great five years ago when we had no inflation <laughs> or little inflation. Uh, but most of those stable coins are, when they were built five years ago, were built on this idea that, oh, we can make a promise that it's backed by something and people will believe us. So te Tether, famously has been audited a couple of times because there's a lot of questions about what backs Tether. USDC is famously, you know, holding treasury and cash at a bank account at Silvergate um, to, to back USDC and audited every month, but they don't disclose exactly what's where and everything like that. Bacon or the new coin that we built on top of Bacon, which is called Behome, is a coin that's backed by a pool of mortgages. And that pool of mortgages is underwritten to Fannie Mae standards. 
And the way that process works is basically originators originate a loan and the protocol evaluates that loan and then puts that loan into the pool. And then that lien, right, that um, is part of that backs the coin dollar for dollar. And then the cash flows are the what we call the plus part. So it's a stable coin plus. So the process is basically the protocol purchases a loan, so to speak. That loan includes two things. It's a lien and we wrap an NFT around that lien. And then we lend against that lien if it's, if it's us or another originator. We do that work for them if they'd like. Uh, and then from the consumer perspective, they don't see anything. And as far as they're concerned, they just have a home loan. They get the USD dollars, you know, that is represents the, the funded amount. Uh, and then they make a payment just like they normally would from their bank account. They can make it from their crypto wallet as well, but most people do it from their bank account. And that money flows back to the people who participate uh, in creating and servicing that loan, as well as the lion's share of that money goes back to the coin holders, the people who actually lent the money uh, to that borrower through the coin. And um, what, you know, what prevents, uh, what prevents ba- the bacon protocol um, from being used to, to launder money since, you know, the, you know, crypto is pretty unregulated. Um, how, how do you think about, uh, you know, regulatory issues and potential fraud and, and, and money laundering? Yeah. So those are, uh, kind of the common crypto concerns. Um, it's pretty easy to launder U.S. dollars, right? So crypto, it's funny, um, is probably the worst money laundering vehicle I could possibly imagine. Uh, if you look at the Ethereum blockchain, every transaction you make is public. So I'm, I'm pretty sure money launderers don't want people to know that their transactions are, are public, but maybe. Uh, and as you no, there's been a lot of recent talk about some of the security things and, and that have happened. And the problem that the people who are, you know, hacking these systems and taking, quote, taking the money, they can't do anything with it because it's public on the blockchain. If it moves, everybody knows about it. And a lot of the exchanges just what they call, you know, blacklist the wallet so they actually can't spend it. So the corollary in the real world is you steal money from a bank and that little plastic thing explodes and paints the money. And every bank knows that those bills are no good. Uh, and, and so that's basically what happens in the, in, in the crypto space. So um, look, all systems can be abused. Um, I just spoke at the Honor Foundation with a bunch of special operations uh, people for, who are both serving now and have served. And it's interesting, they have categorized crypto in particular as a tool of freedom. And it's a tool of freedom because in other countries, your bank can freeze your assets and you're done. You, you can do whatever you want, but you can't take your money out of the bank. And so when we're working with these countries to free their people, part of that freedom is being able to leave that country and spend their money that they earned in some other country. And crypto provides that. Uh, and so I, I think that um, you know a lot of this stuff around money laundering and the criminal activities and everything like that, sure, Absolutely. You know, the internet was abused for a lot of bad things early on. U.S. dollars are abused for a lot of things. And by the way, that's not traceable and it's certainly not public. Uh, so I, I doubt very much that somebody would choose to use a protocol that ends up putting money into Fannie Mae mortgages uh, would be used for money laundering. Andrew, I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, the, you know, maybe, maybe dive into a little bit more detail in, in as to what you think this might mean for for, for the GSEs, um, you know they they they've uh, um, they've been funding a majority of mortgages for a good stretch now. Um, they're they're still under conservatorship. Um, we are starting to see you know some more uh, private label securities go to market. Uh, that is ramping up. Um, what do you, what do you think? How, how do you think this changes things if, if it changes things at all? Yeah, no, it's a it's an interesting question because um, I mean I think at the end of the day, you know, if if all of a sudden these loans are, are going, you know, aren't going into a uh, a Fannie Mae, a Freddie Mac, uh, or a Ginny Mae uh, backed security and kind of being sold off in a private market, um, you you know, that's a it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting concept because. 
that right there, I mean, there's a, as everybody knows on the line or uh, may not know, there's, there's implied G fees or guarantee fees that the government collects on all the bonds that they originate. So, you know, for, for the Ginny May side, that's about six basis points on top of, you know, what they capture um, with the, I think the MIP uh, mortgage insurance premium. And then also, you know, on the, on the Fannie and Freddie side, I, I think, you know, for the conventional 30 year, there's about a, you know, anywhere between a 43 to 45 uh, basis point G fee. So, so that right there, they're, they're collecting money, you know, on each bond that is originated based off the underlying uh, origination, based off the, you know, the loans that are, the loan collateral going into these bonds. So it, it really does, I mean, it really does bring up a, a great question to, to see exactly, you know, if, if this does take hold and if, you know, you know, how long it takes to, to get this to be more uh, common practice. Um I think it'll be interesting to see kind of how it evolves because I, I think you do see more origination flowing away from uh, Fannie and Freddie and, you know, their, I, I think their biggest, uh, I mean, their, <laughs> their job was to create liquidity for, for, for homeowners. Right. So, you know, if it, if it goes back to that's what their priority is, then maybe they stick to, you know, looking at uh, low to moderate income borrowers and try to find ways to, to, to take, you know, some of what they're making and uh, apply that back into, uh, into origination for, for those borrowers. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a really interesting question when you get down to it to see exactly, you know, how blockchain could, could overall um, uh, affect that, you know, the, their bond issuance, uh, you know, and how that would affect the, the overall market. Because, I mean, uh, as, as we all see, you know, with uh, the Fed stepping in and buying, you know, mortgage-backed securities, you know, starting, you know, 2008, uh, you know, QE1, 2012, I think 13, QE2. Um, I think 17, 18, and then, you know, again here in 2020, um, you know, they, they've played a critical role in kind of supporting the market. And if that's not, if that is not going to help in the future, it'll be interesting to see what it does from an economic standpoint and how that affects the overall economy. If they're not able to pull those lever levers to kind of, to soften, uh, to soften recessions or to, to kind of, to boost the economy, it would be real interesting from a, from an economic standpoint on how, you know, how that affects the, the overall U S economy, truthfully. Yes. I'm sticking with you. You mentioned before that, uh, I think it was 68% of, of lenders haven't really started to engage with the, you know, the concept of, of the blockchain as it relates to mortgage. Um, you know, what, what are you advising those, those lenders that, 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 that are your clients who, who just haven't, who haven't engaged yet? What, what do you, what's your message to them? I mean, the, the, the great thing about lenders is they're always, um, they're always looking for the next thing. They're always looking for ways to bring in more production. How can we, you know, how can we fil facilitate a loan to this borrower, right? That, that's what the originators do best. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of discussion with clients on, you know, non-QM production, uh, long-term lock production, trying to lock in a, a lower rate right now, even though the loan won't be done for like another year. Um, it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of interesting. So, so the way that we're looking at it is we're definitely trying to, um, to stay on top of it and, you know, talk to the originators about, you know, the new technology that's coming down the line. Um, you know, I think Carl and his group, uh, they're definitely on the, on the forefront of this and, uh, pushing that innovation. And I think, you know, um, getting more, getting more lenders to understand exactly the, the nuances of how it all works and what needs to be in place in order for it to work. Um, are, are going to be, you know, some, some fundamental things that we'll have to, you know, make sure that the clients are, uh, are, are kind of working towards, right? Um, this isn't going to be something that happens overnight. And I think it's all going to be a, a progression. And, you know, like I said earlier, I think adoption is the biggest, uh, is the biggest key and, you know, getting people educated on the, 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 the technology, the functionality. Uh, I, I think that that just leads to, you know, leads to greater adoption of it. I'm wondering if you can can tie this all back to the to the tip of the spear housing professional. You know, I'm thinking of the of the loan originator, even even back to the real estate agent. Um, you know, what 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 do you think these innovations mean for them? You know, how can they interact with with loan snap and 
and some of your peers that are that are innovating, you know, with blockchain and, and mortgage. Yeah, you bet. I what, one quick thing on the kind of GSEs and the world uh, on the uh, economic side. I, I think one of the interesting things that's going on is this is about to become a global thing. And so, if you think about 2008 and 2020, and you know QE and all that stuff, that is a very U.S. centric thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was a group of people who made a decision to support the economy. It'd be interesting to see what would happen if you had a global market and all of a sudden other buyers were able to move very, very quickly into the space and support, you know, an asset class that around the world is is really revered. Right. And 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 it's one of the it's the jealousy of, of many, 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 many countries. And so I think the idea there is that you know if you had outside capital that could move very very quickly you might not just have the u.s government buying those bonds slash mortgages um on how it's going to affect real estate professionals and and loan officers i think two two things let's start with loan officers so i think with loan officers and this is somewhat specific to loan snap so i think the ability for us to open up our platform to allow any loan officer to participate in the ecosystem was a decision we made about three months ago. Um, you know, Salesforce is in the cloud, all these other technologies in the cloud. Why don't you have the ability to originate a loan in the cloud and do it on at Sunday at 1 p.m. if you want to? And so I think that's going to just transform the lives of many loan officers who are currently, you know, so to speak, chained to a desk <laughs> and a certain number of hours and a certain company, to be honest, which is, is I think, about to change very radically. And we, we know that a lot of loan officers are very independent individuals and would prefer, in particular, ones that work mostly with purchase to, to work with people they know and people who are local. And so I think that's one innovation that's going to change that world a lot. On real estate professionals themselves, I think it's really going to be speed. You know, really the thing that it kills a lot of these transactions and basically makes a cash offer better than any kind of lending offer is speed. And you know, so we're working on some programs on that, like, you know, cash, the same, you know, loan is same as cash kind of thing. But I think as part of that, we have to be closing loans in 24 hours, not seven days or 15 days. Um, and that's possible. And, and that's possible partially with the tech that we built already, but also the blockchain on the funding side. We were talking about the GSEs early earlier, let's, let's say they fund loans and send it seven days. Maybe it's five, maybe it's seven. I, you know, it's hard, hard to tell. Uh, the protocol we built funds loans in a couple of minutes. Right. And, and so you look at how we think about that compared to the other people who buy our loans. That's a massive difference for us as a company and for the consumer. And it just turns something that is a relatively laborious, long process even on the back end, even once you've gotten all the paperwork done into something that's lightning fast. Um, so I think that's going to change real estate agents' lives for the better, to be honest, because you'll be able to have effectively what I would call a pre-guaranteed offer, not even pre-qual, pre-approved or whatever, but literally all the documents are ready to go. Everything's all set to go. And the funding is waiting in the wings, so to speak, versus where we are today. So uh, let, let's quickly tie that through. I mean, you talked about the, 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 the real estate agent. Uh, you talked about the LO. Uh, let's, let's go to the end of the transaction. How does this um, flow from you know, funding a mortgage into title and escrow? What's, that, what's the process of um, you know, recording in, in county land records you know, so people know that there's a, there's a lien on the property and all, and all that good stuff? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great thing. There's a lot of innovation going on in that space as, as well. As we all know, there, there are some areas where that's super slow and, and quite manual. And there's some newer uh, title companies that are like Doma and Spruce, you know, who are kind of taking on the burden of guaranteeing that those things will happen and building the electronic systems to support those. And, and so when we think about the world, you know, we think about the world as like things we can change and things we can't. And things that we can't, um, we're going to work with partners who are, you know, solid partners and are trying to innovate in, in those spaces. Notary is another space, right? Appraisals is another space. Um, and, and, you know, those real world things are a reality. I think that's a positive thing, honestly. If you think about the net benefit to the, 
to the blockchain, it's really that these assets exist and these systems exist off chain in a way that uh, doesn't impact what goes happens on the chain. So there's value on the chain, but it's held off the chain. And I think that's a really fundamental thing. And that takes people and a lot of people in order to be uh, make that happen. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll work with our, our partners and, and others in order to you know, bring that speed to close and title and everything like that down as quickly as possible, while also obeying the regulatory laws and everything like that, and making sure that, like you mentioned, the lien gets recorded. And then, you know, for us, that's the thing, like, as long as that lien gets recorded and we can wrap the NFT around it and keep those two in sync. So you got to imagine this NFT that exists in the blockchain world has to stay completely in sync with the liens in the real world. If that somehow doesn't happen, then you know the the system as it would in the real world would break. How do you guys think? Uh, uh, you know, there's there's talk of a of a of a U.S. backed digital currency. Um, Carl, maybe, maybe maybe we'll start with you on this one, but I'd love Andrew's perspective as well. How do you think that might impact? what you're working on and, and, you know, funding, the funding of mortgages from, from the blockchain. So uh, Brian Brooks is one of our advisors. He was the comp controller for, for a while. And so he has uh, a lot of great data about, about things like this. Look, I, I think governments creating their own digital currency is an interesting thing to do. I think there are a lot of great currencies already out there on the blockchain. Um, this is kind of more of a philosophical discussion about controlling the currency for the world. Uh, the dollar is effectively the currency of the world, and we use that very, very well uh, to achieve lots of uh, leverage in situations that we couldn't do if that wasn't the case. I think a lot of other countries are trying to um, compete with that, particularly on the digital side, look at what China's doing. And, and so that, you know, you look at what we're doing here on the digital side for the digital currency for the United States, it's effectively a reaction to what China is doing, because the worry is that, you know, if it got big enough, it would compete with the dollar. Uh, the other approach would be to adopt one of the cryptocurrencies or multiple of the cryptocurrencies that are already out there um, and use those as there's, there's, it doesn't necessarily have to be controlled by the government. In fact, it may not be successful if it's controlled by a government rather than, than used by a government. And then all the services and lending and all the different tools that people use are on top of that, that currency, which is what makes the currency valuable. I mean, if nobody uses it or, or nobody will lend against it, it's not very good. Yeah, no, and speaking of, uh, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the Chinese and their cryptocurrency, one thing that I, I remember and this was, I mean, I want to say a couple couple years ago that they were actually trying to, um, just like the U.S. was trying to kind of uh, boost the economy by providing funds to, um, you know, individuals and trying to get them saying, hey, you know, um, I think like like we did in 2020, where we're like, hey, here's a couple thousand, you know, go ahead and go out and spend it. We'll provide you guys, um, you know, with checks and, you know, we want you guys to go out and you know, uh, support your local economy when you can, right? Go ahead and go out and spend the money. Um, but what, what was happening in the U S is a lot of that, uh, a lot of that actually turned into savings. It wasn't actually being spent. Um, so it, I don't think it had the economic effect that, that the U S was looking for. But one thing that's interesting about China in that respect is that they offered, I think they did something similar, but it was based off their cryptocurrency but then they had an expiration on it. So if it's like, if you didn't use it within a six month window, then it just goes back to the government or just kind of just goes away. So what's interesting in that is that that was, an, it, it wasn't, it couldn't be used for savings. It had to be used for, uh, for, for to go out and to, to, to spur the economy, right? So, so I think that is one interesting aspect of it that I remember um, from, you know, the, the Chinese cryptocurrency. And I thought that that would be a good way for the, you know, good for the U.S. to have something, you know, similar. But that kind of, you know, I think that kind of goes to a whole centralized banking construct, right? So I think with cryptocurrency, you're looking at a, a, a decentralized kind of finance um, environment where it's, you know, it's, it's kind of spread out over the over the globe and it's not necessarily uh, confined to, to, to one centralized agency. So, um, 
I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to, to think about it and how it's going to have ramifications uh, across, you know, all, you know, you know, the global, uh, the global economy. Um, but it's just, uh, I, I think it's interesting to kind of, to look at it from, uh, you know, to see if the U S is going to have, you know, their, their own kind of cryptocurrency or if they're going to adopt one of the other ones, uh, as Carl's w- was mentioning. Yeah. Um, when they're pitching it, I sure hope they don't use that example. Because that's basically putting money in people's bank accounts, and then if they don't spend it, taking it back. Exactly. And, uh, I, I, that, that, that's, that if, and that's the problem a lot of people have with a government-run digital currency, right? Is those economic desires get translated into technology that's capable of doing that instantaneously, right? Scary, um, right? Yeah. And and so and this is where it gets back to like what's what are the tools of freedom? Right. And, and, you know, I, I think it's just a little scary. The tools of freedom are free and, and, and don't have rules that come with them. And, and that is, is hard for a lot of governments to handle. So what happens to, um, you know, mortgage processing and mortgage underwriting? If, if, if these documents are kind of, <laughs> um, you know, flowing through APIs and, you know, the, the, you know, the, there's a lot of transparency. Doesn't that mean that there's a lot less need for for the processing and the underwriting? What you know, what typically makes a mortgage process, you know, take 40, 50 days? Um, what what happens to that? Well, so we have that going on in our company, right? So we we're definitely quite a bit smaller on the operational side than well than any mortgage company we know of, right? And what we find is that it takes a lot of the checkers, checking the checkers is kind of one of our favorite phrases that we use out of the system um, and leaves human beings to do things they're really good at, which is think. You know, if I'm just checking one number in one box and, you know, copying and pasting it to another box, a machine can do that pretty well. In fact, a lot more accurately than than a person can do. Um, So I think underwriters and processors become even more important in where we're headed because they're actually going to be making judgment calls, particularly on the underwriting side where the machine says, gosh, I, I, I don't know, but this looks odd and have a human being say, yeah, that probably is a vacation house. That's not their primary home or um, that document doesn't look right. right? And that, that's, I think the idea that it's going to replace human beings, I think is bunk. It's, it's man or woman and machine not versus machine. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, I just mortgage has been something relatively new in my career. It's only the last probably six, six or seven years. And uh, that idea I've heard a bunch of times, you just don't hear that any in any other industry that I've contacted with because everybody else is great. I don't want to put that tire on that rim 40,000 times a year. I want a machine to do that. And when that machine makes a mistake, I want to teach that machine. And then the next time, I want to help program the new version and everything like that. So I think it's more people are going to have to are going to elevate what they do in those roles versus those roles going away. All right, let's go into the bonus bonus round here. Um, we've got six minutes left. Um, again, the the audience questions are are syncing with uh, with my pre- prepared questions. Um, uh, crypt, crypto backed mortgages, right? So we we've we've had some mm-hmm. announcements from. Uh, from from Milo, uh, from from Figure, you, you brought up Provenance before. Um, you know that people are going to be able to use their their crypto um, as collateral it, it, for for a mortgage. Is that, is that hype? Is that reality? What, what do you guys think about 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 crypto backed mortgage, mortgages? All right, Andrew, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, how many of those I'm not gonna lie, right? Carl. This is this is definitely more your 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 arena than mine. So I'll I'll let you uh, I'll let you go with it. Well, I, I I'm a huge fan of innovation. Obviously, right? Um, it is a lot of hype. I, I just got to be honest, right? I mean, the, the the if you dig into them, they look a lot like loans that happen early on as people got a lot of stock wealth, so they would lend money against the stock and then use that to buy the house or somehow offset the fact that they were doing a mortgage at a, at a lower rate. I, I guess when I hear crypto backed mortgage or crypto mortgage, my first question is, what do you mean? 
And, and most people don't mean that they are literally have an underwriter who we just spoke about who's going to look at the person's balance sheet and say, oh yeah, that Ethereum on their balance sheet is worth $3,400 in ETH. Oh wait, it's worth $2,000 in ETH. Oh wait, it's $1,000. Oh, oh wait, it's $5,000. And so I, I do think banks like Silvergate and Bank Proper are getting more sophisticated about lending against those assets and are willing to take that risk. And I think that's a positive step. But I think the idea that we have anything close to a true crypto loan is, is ridiculous. They just, they just aren't there. And I, I don't know any takeout partners. In fact, I, I'm really curious if we took this to, we, so a lot of these protocols have what we call a DAO, which is an organization that governs the protocol. It's all the people who invest money to get to effectively get to vote. I think if we proposed a crypto loan to that community, we would get some pretty interesting reactions and I don't think they'd be very positive. Um, so I think w until we get to a point where there are actually you know, like stable coins that are actually backed and by transparent assets and of, of scale, that's going to be a, a true crypto loan is going to be difficult because nobody knows how to value this stuff. And so what they do is they lend against it at pretty aggressive rates. But look, at the end of the day, if you break the margin, you know, if it's, let's say you lend at 70% and a lot of people say, well, look, if it goes anywhere above that, um, we're going to take all your money. Yeah. And so that, that's not really what a homeowner wants, wants to hear. And so I think there's a lot of innovation. I love the idea. Um, I, I just think that we're, we're a ways away from what I would call real crypto loans. And I'm curious who's the first takeout partner. Um, I'm sure Andrew's talking to him right now uh, <laughs> um, and, and what they're going to say. Andrew, so I'd, I'd love for you to have the last word today, uh, you know, t tie it all together for us and any final thoughts uh, for our audience. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the main thing I would say is, you know, get educated and, um, you know, don't, don't be afraid of new technology. I, I think these, the, you know, distributed um, ledger technology, the blockchain, I mean, this is going to be a great thing that uh, a lot of companies are going to be using in the future. It's a great way to, to, to store data, to have transparency of data, to trust the data that you're seeing. Um, and, and I think that it just, it, it, it's going to be a, a thing that everybody's going to use in the future. So having, you know, having knowledge around it is, is going to be crucial in growing your business. Uh, you know, whether that's a originator, lender, bank, uh, I think these, these companies are all going to grow and they're all going to gain some adoption of this technology. And, uh, the more you know about it, the, I, I think the better prepared you are to, to deal with the future. Carl, quick question from the audience. Where can you purchase the Be Home coin? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, baconcoin.com, B-A-C-O-N coin.com. All right, guys, this has been great. Uh, I don't think I've seen this many audience questions come in in, in 60 minutes ever uh, in, in moderating <laughs> panels. Really appreciate both of you taking the time to, to share your thoughts with, with, with our readers. Thanks so much. Great, thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys.